Giacomo's. <laughs> Sal, he's the man. Giacomo's Italian Market. We had him on the podcast. We're doing a pop-up together. Um, I don't know if I've met anyone who has as real as Sal. He hugs me every time I see him. I love Sal. And you know what else I love about him? His food. His food is fantastic. Um, It's an Italian market right over there on College Hill. Uh, He's got sausages. He's got his own soda now. He's got... There's pasta. Uh, there's the rice balls. There, there is so much stuff over there that is just unique and special. And then you got the menu. The breakfast sandwich I was lucky enough to have, that's killer. The sausage sandwich is killer. The sausage itself is killer. The cheesesteak is killer. Giacomo's is such a unique thing to this area, and I'm so happy. It's like 10 minutes from the studio. But Giacomo's, man, they are on... What is it? 700 Cattell Street in Easton, College Hill. And you can go to GiacomosItalianMarket.com. Um, I cannot wait to do more things with him. I'm selling his sausage sandwich called the G-Spot. We're doing that on uh, our pop-ups. So that is Giacomo's Italian Market. Please go check them out. Love them to death. Uh, they are a new sponsor. And thank you so much for sponsoring the show. Mindleaf CBD. I'm a lot calmer, calmer with this read. You know why? Because I'm using these products for Mindly. Uh, Liz came on the show multiple times. Awesome story on how she got into this. They are making all their products. We got the barbecue pretzels. The pretzels are fire. The tinctures, those are my big thing that I use. I go to sleep with those. The tinctures put knock this, knock this groundhog out every time I go to bed. Uh, the CBD gummies are great. And the Delta 8s. The Delta 8s are fantastic. They'll put you on the moon. I enjoy that. Seriously, though, uh, this is a fantastic CBD product. I stand behind it. I got to use all of their stuff. And um, it is 100% the go-to thing I use now for joint pain, uh, for going to sleep. Uh, the snacks are awesome as well. It's just an added bonus. I'll go over to the store and pick those up. Uh, Liz is one of a kind. You can follow their social media, uh, Mindleaf CBD, and then it's mindleafcbd.com that you can order all their stuff online so if you're not local to the area if you are local i suggest you go over to the shop they have a really cool shop over on uh college hill it's actually close to giacomo's which is another sponsor but um that's mind leaf cbd um get your tinctures get your delta eights get your gummies get all of your cbd needs from mind leaf we're doing pop-ups and things together as well so uh follow their social media we are connecting them into the network so uh go support them because they support me uh uh, appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Five and Dime Easton.com. They have their website officially up. You can shop most of their stuff online. They also uh, they also have fucked. They have fucked in the store. I think they're the only one allowed to sell fucked out of their store. Uh, it's 484-544-4719. That's at Five and Dime Easton on social media. These guys are great. I mean, they're killing it. It's the best skate shop, in my opinion, in the area. They have a lot of cool stuff there. Both the owners are rad. I stop in when I can. Uh, they're open Monday through Friday, 11 to 7, Saturday, 10 to 7, and Sunday, 11 to 5. There is someone always there to help you out with your needs. You can check their inventory off the website. You can check out some videos they got on there, and they're doing some cool things. Their social media is awesome. They support a lot of local skaters in the area, and they're growing. I'm excited to be a part of them growing. I'm excited to help them out. They're helping me out. It's a good relationship, and I push Five and Dime Easton because they're the best skate shop in the area. Check them out. BTG Blasting, my man, Pat Cunningham, offering you pressure washing, disinfecting, acid washing, and rust removal. It is a high pressure washing business, bringing your stuff back to glory. He does anything from houses all the way to having him come into the studio. He comes down to the studio on a schedule and he disinfects the studio and we are certifiably clean and you, it just covers all the bases. So with the things that are going on now, you're going to be you're going to need somebody like this. He's got a sticker out front. I am certifiably clean down here. He also offers free estimates on all your needs. He can do corporate and at home. You can reach him at 484-241-1711 and btgblasting at gmail.com. He just started this business and it is taking off. I'm super excited for him and I'm super excited that he's a sponsor of the show. And you can check out BTG Blasting on social media for all of your presser washing, disinfecting, acid wash, and rust removal needs. It's high pressure washing, bringing your stuff back to glory. He offers many things and you need to check him out. Eric K. Dowdle. 
defense attorney. We had him on the show, and what crazy stories this guy's had. He's helped a ton of people over the years. And uh, if you're looking for help, he is your guy. You can contact them at 610-882-3000, and it's ekdefense.com. Uh, do you have a pending court case? Do you have a court appearance and need a defense lawyer? Do you need proper representation? Felony misdemeanor, drug offense, assault, homicide, DUI, traffic violation, appeals. Reach out to Eric. Check out the podcast we did with him as well. It has his whole whole story on there. If you need help, Eric is here to help you. He sponsors the show. We appreciate it. He's going to be doing a monthly thing with us. Eric will be a part of the family now. Thank you for sponsoring. Is usually here, but this is how we started out. So it's like a full circle. Episode maybe 205. What's up, man? Welcome to Never Again Radio. How are you? I'm doing excellent. It's glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm glad we finally got to do this. Uh, Jeremiah Rouse, he's on the one twos. Uh, yeah. He had turned me on to you. Um, is this your first time on video with us? It is my first time, yes. Yeah. Thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah, of course, Very man. We, we barely get to Very see each other. Stuff. <laughs> uh, his son Tucker um, has worked the board races, uh, part of uh, I'm slowly adapting into their family. Um, they told me about you. I started checking your stuff out, and uh, you build uh, bike frames. I do. Um, when the hell did you start getting into bikes? When did you start getting into building? Where does this journey begin? So I would say for me, it starts. When I was a little tiny baby, <laughs> I got to grow up in a race car shop. Yeah? Yeah, so fabricating really is in my blood. Um, in high school, I raced bicycles. So every kid had to do a graduation project. Um, some kids did community service. Some kids did like an engine transplant on their car. I decided to build a bicycle frame because I was into BMX at the time. So I wanted to do it. Um, I had obviously the place to do it and my uncles helped me. I got to learn how to do some drafting skills from a friend who did CAD. So I got to, you know, learn the programming side of it. And then, um, yeah, I put the first one into production. That was my graduation project. Got to ride it in this high school. Everybody thought I was crazy, but I'm like riding my bike down the hallway and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, it's my project. That's what I made. So. How long did it take for the, was it the entire school year that you were supposed to be working on the project when they have that, no, like that the was, graduating thing? Or was it like the last semester? Or You actually did it in 11th grade. Yeah. They wanted it done before you got into your senior year because in senior year, uh, you're trying to pick colleges and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of other stuff going on. But yeah, 11th grade, you have a, like a advisor or whatever that would oversee your project and you go to a meeting once a month and show your advisor where you're at with your project and tell her what your idea is you had to get approval first but they were cool with it they were like oh yeah bicycle frame you could make that sure you think you could do it yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say were they impressed every time you yeah, kept coming were. back and they yeah. were like holy shit <laughs> yeah when i wrote it into the to the presentation it was probably the best moment because they were like he really did it he built a bike that's crazy and from there i took it to the racetrack raced it and the geometry wasn't that great on it. I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of picked numbers out of a hat and said, oh, yeah, we're going to have this angle and this this length seat poop tube. And so it didn't make a lot of sense. But we improved, and uh, I raced it. A lot of people just gave me credit even for doing it. And they're yeah. like, wow, that's super cool. Will you make me one? I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll make, you an make another one. And I made a handful more when I was a kid. And then... That's crazy. So you were, like, making bikes for your friends? Yeah, yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably close to eight, I would say, back then. Yeah. I had a real teeny one. There's only one bike that I don't have a picture of or or anything. Um, I know who has it. Bill Hayden. You still owe me a picture of that bike. I know you have it still, so let's hook it up. Uh, but yeah, then I just took a long break. Got, uh, got uh, sidetracked with other things in life. College. Working. Found an excellent woman. My wife, Erica. And that's it. And took a long break from BMX racing. Where did the design come from when you were that young? Like, where, did you have it pictured out in your head? Was was it, like, something that you were, like, you know, you saw other bikes, you know, growing up back then, and then you were had it in your head and you wanted to create it or where did the where did the appeal of the design of building a bicycle i mean because you know i, just I was like putting different. cards and wheels i just wanted to be different <laughs> i wanted to have something nobody else had yeah. because back then i mean still to this day jerry you know it like when when you're at the track your bike kind of sets you apart like everybody's looking at your stuff like you could be a good rider and sometimes that alone gets you noticed it doesn't matter what kind of bike you're on but um 
regardless, I think everybody looks at your bike. And that was always my thing as a kid. I was always looking at stuff, the equipment, yeah. what kind of bikes are out there and what did I want? What was my dream bike? And it was like, well, I want to have something that nobody else has. How do I do that? I guess I have to make it myself. And that was just something that was really truly in my blood is if, if you want something, you just make it yourself. And I, you know, like I said, I grew up in a race car shop, so I saw every idea that they had, they could just make it. And it was like nothing for me to do the same thing with a That's bike. That's a super unique way to grow up. Yeah. Yeah, it was excellent. And then so you started uh, designing and you made a couple. And then, you know, where, where were you at when you were making like your, you know, your eighth bike? Was it something that you wanted to still keep doing? Or was it just kind of like, you know, were you, when you said you took a break from it, like were you just um, tired I, of creating at that time? No, no, not at all. I didn't even really know what I was doing at that point. It was like so... Uh, so crude and primitive with everything I was doing that I'm shocked I even held together now, like <laughs> yeah, in hindsight. Yeah. Um, but um, I would say I took a break really just because I stopped racing and really just life took me on a different path temporarily yeah. until I, until um, we went to a music festival. I had one of my bikes that I made when I was a kid. I had this bike with me to ride around and I just ran into some random photographer and stopped and was talking to him and he was asking me about my bike um he asked me where i got it you know he said it's just really cool looking it's really unique where did you get that and i said i made it and he said oh what do you mean like you put it together <laughs> and i said no i designed it and fabricated it it's one of a kind i made it when i was a kid and he goes oh wow that's really cool that's really cool what do you do for a living and i said i'm a mechanic at a greenhouse and he said you don't sound very enthusiastic are you happy and I said, not really. And he goes, well, quit your job, man. You're an artist. You should build bikes. And I, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. I went home and I'm like, why did I stop? Why did I stop racing? That was like the best time of my life. I, I had the most fun. I felt like I had no responsibility. Um, now, obviously, turning it into a career, you have responsibility. But I went home really charged up from it. And I'm like, how do I... How do I start over again? Where do I start? What do I do? So I reached out to one of my really good friends I raced with, you know, way back in the day. He's been in the bike scene and never left it. He owned his own bike shop. He's still a bike mechanic. I called him and said, Dave, I want to build bikes again. Where do I start? And he's like, man, I'm, I've been waiting to hear that for a long time. Uh, check out Transition. Look at their website. Look at this bike. It's called a PBJ. I have one if you want to see it up close. He said, make something like that. It's fun. You'll have fun riding it. He said, I want one of them, so I'll buy it. And uh, I checked it out, went and saw his bike, looked at everything, and I'm like, all right, let's get digging into this. So start all over again. Let's build a little shop in my basement, and that's still where I'm at right now. Uh, got a new welder, got all the tooling I needed, built a new jig, and kind of took it a little bit of a step ahead, you know? Um, I tried to make things as good as I possibly could for what I had, you know, available. And that was the first bike. It's, it's nice. It's a great bike. I love it. And, um, that really just got me back into the scene. That was the Kickstarter that gave me a reason to go back to a BMX track. I realized how much I love racing again, and it got me back on my bike. I, I had spent a long time where I didn't go to a track at all. And then the skills came back, and I'm like, wow, I could still ride this thing. I, you know, I still feel good on it. And um, don't get me wrong, like they're like the whole time I rode a bike, I had road bikes and stuff. I didn't not cycle at all, but BMX specific, I was not on a track at all. So it was a great reason to get that back into my life. And um, I've just made so many, so many great friendships, even in this short three year span. That I sincerely, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have them at this point. How often do you look back at that moment with the photographer? All the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. I have a huge piece of art that I got off him that weekend, and it hangs on my living room wall, and every morning I just sit there and like appreciate his inspiration to do Did that. Did you ever reach out to him since then? Yeah, he wants to do a photo shoot. He wants me to come to Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> he wants a bike. He's like, Tony, tons of people are in the city, and they all have cash, and they would love some posh shit like that. Yeah. And... uh he's like you should bring a bike down here and put it in my studio and have it here and i'm like all right that'll you know it'll be one day but you're like i just got to keep growing you yeah get to the point where i can handle you know handle the orders i don't want it to get out of control to where i can't supply people yeah i think that would be a nightmare because right now i'm still by myself it's hard um 
we did 50 frames this year. We're, we're on par to do 50 frames this year. And it's like crazy to think of them all lined up in the room. If there were 50 bikes in the room to think, wow, I made them this year. That's, it's a lot looking back. But. It's crazy um, having moments like that where it's just a run in with somebody or you just get that push of motivation or um, just the general, I'm, you know, because I'm sure you, you had thoughts and things going around, but they weren't formed. And then when somebody says something like that, it's like, oh, I should be doing that. And why wouldn't I be doing something I like so much? And yeah. why am I doing this job that I hate or yeah, like I, I following truly, a, a path that doesn't make sense? I truly hated it. And it was like, really robbing me of any joy like it was turning me to a person that i did not like anymore like terrible to come the worst home and, rides to work yeah it, it, it was it it was like dreading work every day yeah having to come home immediately and crack a beer and that sucks that's no good lifestyle it's not uh -uh. it's not healthy. and you don't even realize you're in it because you get consumed yep. of living that way and then yep. it becomes normal to be miserable and then it's really hard to get out of that and then try and find something you're passionate about especially something that you loved doing yeah when you were younger and now it's super cool now every bike at this point is built to order so a customer orders a bike and i just i just had a new idea that i'm going to do when you order your bike um, and I receive payment. The first thing I'm going to do is go stamp the head badge because that's your serial plate and your model. So when you order that bike and I tell you what serial you're going to get, I'm going to take a picture of it and send it to you. And that's like your first little thing that your bike is kind of in the assembly line officially now. Um, and when I'm building your bike, one thing I find neat is that you're like in the back of my mind. That person is already, it's already theirs. I'm making it for you. It's your bike that I made for you. It's not just some, you know, S squared that I called up Dan's comp and I ordered and it was one off a rack that yeah. was mass produced. I made it the whole time intentionally for you. Um, and I don't think that's something you could really buy from anybody else. Does that trigger back to when you were making those first eight bikes for your friends? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Because it was for them. You know, it was something that was made for a specific person. It's but like, now you have the skill set to make it how they would want it not just like you being like hey here's your bike i made you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's come like full circle into what you were doing yeah when you were a kid mm -hmm. that's got to be freeing and um i know like and I, I talk to people all the time doing the things that they love and when you're on that path it just feels like it's hard to it, describe but you know i'm sure you know what i'm talking about it's just like you feel like you're moving forward and it's like a positive direction it's not that gloom of waking up like mm -hmm. when i started doing this full time it was the first time like i would wake up on a sunday and not hate knowing monday was there because you get to do what you love to do yeah. on monday yeah, so it's totally. like when that got taken out everything i do now when i feel like i'm in the correct path it feels like you're moving forward when you were doing all this stuff and then now you're making custom bikes and t you know even before we started you were explaining all this to him and i could tell you absolutely love doing this a hundred percent. Like it's in your, your bones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like never, it was fun it to watch the two of you interacting because you were just like, bah, 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 bah. and then, you know, and, and then as soon as we're this early in the interview and you're like, Oh, I take a picture and I'm going to start doing that. Like you're never, you never stop thinking about how to make your business better. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really what the whole thing, the whole goal in life is, is just to constantly make improvements and yeah, you know, in myself and in the bikes and in other people, how can I, you know, rub off on other people and make their lives better and just be positive in general. And I don't know. I think that's just my main goal. When did you start thinking about leaving your full-time job and jumping into it? Cause I know that's uh, uh, everyone I talk to, um, everybody's different, but it's always hard to take that leap into trusting that the business that you're going to be running is going to be able to like pay your bills and you're going to be able to do this. And Holy shit, I am going to do this for a living. Um, how many bikes in were you before you took the leap to this primarily being your only job? Um, probably within the first 10, it was, it was more the universe pushed me. Uh, I, I really, I hated being at the greenhouse and it really came to a boiling point and it was just, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I, I am so glad that there is no more stress in my life is really the easiest way I could say it. I'm so yeah. glad that everything happened the way it did. I didn't have to kill anybody. I was able to just, just finally just like yeah. done walk away 
and I had a great opportunity to go work at Ingersoll Rand and it was like just the perfect parting time and then I was like you know what I had a start date and it was like a week beforehand I went through all this these hoops to get this job and crazy background checks and everything's fine um when you're going after like a job job like that, it's not like an easy thing. No, I, it's just I, like a waiting game, and yeah. you don't know if they're gonna hire you, and it's this Emails awkward back dance, and yeah, forth and amplitude tests yeah. and so yeah. much yeah. stuff. So yeah, and it's always like a fishing thing in front of you. Like, well, great, you are the correct candidate, but we do actually, have to go through this. Yeah, it was actually a great job, and it was like a couple days beforehand, and I just had like this terrible feeling of dread, of like, am I making the wrong decision? Why am I not putting everything towards me i have to just focus a hundred percent of my energy on me and i'm like it's it's october can i do this for the winter can i make it through the winter if i can like get these bikes out and like really just stay positive and focus can i make this happen and i did it and i asked erica i'm like honey would you be crazy if i backed out of this ir job and she's like i support you you know i totally do she's like if you think you can do it um she's like you can always you can always get another job it's you know you're always gonna have that you can fall back on something else you could do something you're never not gonna do something but and it's always important to realize that too because yeah. when i <clears throat> left the post office um you know i had a long conversation with my parents because i've been working on this for so long and mm -hmm. you know that that was kind of their same thing they're like hey you know like at this point we don't think that anything's gonna make you happy but doing this but you know my dad was like what's the worst thing that happens in two months you go get a job that you would have gotten two months anyways. And then when I like have the support and then was able to actually think in those terms, which I think a lot of people are too scared to take the jump and then realize that yeah. you can just go get a job yeah. anywhere. I, I always, I, I have this, um, I don't know. I say it like this. I feel like I was on a pirate ship and I was forced to walk the plank. Yes. You know? Yeah. And I, and I, I'm serious. I made it to the end and I was like, well, I guess here's it. And I jumped and I landed in this little tiny dinghy. It was tiny, but I was floating, and I'm still here. Yeah. And we're tacking driftwood on. Yeah. And we're making it bigger, and <laughs> yes. it's getting better. Let's go. And I feel, I feel a little better. The sails yeah. are getting bigger. I don't yeah. have to paddle as hard. It's scary as fuck that first week. Or yeah. I was calling my friends and ran businesses. I'm like, what do I do? But my parents, they're like, were so calm happy. down. But luckily for me, like we already had the ball rolling. We yeah. already had our name established. We already had an EIN. We were already a business. It was just like, okay, can I really, do I have it in me? And um, I'm still here. We're doing it. That's the hardest Never part, I think, because, you know, when it's established, too, you get you get used to burning the candle at both ends and, yeah. all right, well, I will do this full time and then come home and then I'll work on the bikes and then, oh, well, I'll do it on the weekends. And then you keep trying to find the right time. And someone told me years ago when I lived in Virginia and, he, you know, working on projects and he was like, it's never going to be the correct time. You just need to do it. And then that's what I try and give people advice now with like, you know, you're either going to be forced into a situation like yourself or you just need to just to, to just go for it. And what's the worst case scenario? You fail. But I failed a million times to get to here. Abraham Lincoln failed twice in business before he was elected president. It's my favorite president. Honest Abe. He was cool, man. Yeah, shout out to Honest Abe. Man, I hope I don't get popped, though. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to be working on your own then and then just doing your own thing and you take the jump and you start, you know, do you did you have orders already? Uh, Yeah, small orders, but things definitely grew really quick, I think. It was just... Was it because now you could put 100% focus into it? Totally. Yeah. I think, I think the universe saw it. It was like, it gave me what I needed. Yeah. Just the powers of the universe of positive energy just really just gave me what I needed and it keeps opening doors for me. Yeah. And then I think it's also important to realize that when you go a hundred percent on your own and you start putting a hundred percent into what you're doing, you, you don't realize until you do that, what was missing from it completely working on its own. Like you have to be in it a hundred percent for it to work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What was it like to get, um, these orders to start coming in and to start growing and, you know, doing it and then, you know, getting to a comfortable point where you're not stressing on things and the, the business is growing. The first like 15 bikes for a team that ordered them were definitely stressful. That kind of got me a little queasy. I was like behind. So how does it. that work? You said it was for a team. Yeah. They approached me and they said, Hey, do you want to be our, you know, our frame sponsor for this year? And I was really excited. That was a great reason for me to like build the entire catalog of frames. Is each frame different then for each rider? Um, 
sort of not every single particular rider gets it gets a custom bike for themselves yeah. but i came up with maybe 15 different sizes so as you grow in size you can have a bike that would fit you and i could accommodate anybody from a five-year-old to a six foot five you know 50 year old 100 year old whatever. yeah so then um what was it like building those frames for that how long did that take a little longer than projected because you know um some of the materials ended up being late. It was like right mid COVID. So it was hard getting certain things and like time was just, it was all messed up. But, um, let me think here. The first 15. Well, how long were you running this before COVID hit? Um, we start, we, we st officially started back up in like 2018 is when I decided to, to open it. And, started working to get the shop set up and everything like that, getting my equipment. Um, the end of 2018, 2019 is when we officially got incorporated and started our LLC, like January of 2019. And then in the fall, everything kind of was a shit show and <clears throat> racing was messed up for 2020. This year has been really good. Knock on wood, everything was fine. And it seems like BMX has been kind of unfazed by it. Yeah. A lot of it's outdoors and we're kind of people that don't really care anyway. Did you pick up? Uh, more orders because of COVID and then like people buying bikes and doing more things outside? Um, Not really. Maybe yes and no. Maybe a little bit more, but nothing crazy. A lot of it was stuff that were just local riders that, you know, really liked what I'm doing and they wanted to support somebody local and it was time for them to get a new bike anyway. So a lot of people just around here see it and it seems like every bike I put out is like more... Uh, solidity that it's it's a real thing like it's a real brand you can have this it's a yeah. cool bike people like them and then i don't know it's just growing and growing rapidly now so how fast or not how fast but like when you got that 15 done that puts obviously more eyes on your bike could you do you see the growth going into what you just said where it's like you know everything you put out it's like oh you know like who's that what is that and then now you're becoming known as this custom bike thing like what's that like feeling it grow from you know, all the way back to where you started eight, with those eight bikes. Amazing. It feels unbelievable. The first time I went to a race and I saw all these frames there, I literally started <laughs> getting choked up. I, That's I thought awesome. I was going to cry. I'm like, yeah. holy shit, they're all my babies. Look at all these things. I made every single one, and I knew every little kid that was going to get that bike and, like, the excitement they were going to have when they got it. And it, it would all kind of held true. You know, they're all super stoked to see them and ride them and have something that special. How does it feel to be accepted into that community that you grew up in, and then now you're making bikes for kids that were your age doing that stuff? And it's, it's got to be surreal to be just kind of hanging out in that childhood. Yeah, it's full circle. You know, that was one of my big things was I looked up to so many people back then who were fast, and, you know, they were just good people. And now I kind of get to be the same role model for, for kids. What's that like? I don't know. It just makes me so happy. Yeah, yeah. It's a little pressure to always do good, but yeah. if you're, you know, if that's just where your head's at, it's not hard. It's not hard to do good. Yeah. So after the 15 bikes, um, what was the next big thing after that that you kind of tackled to make it, you know, there's obviously steps into where you are now. Um, hmm, where do we go after that? After that, it was, it was kind of just like a nice steady run of production at that point. Yeah. Uh, and your name's getting out there more. You're getting a little bit more known. Yeah. You're doing it full time. Yeah, I have a pro that's on one of my bikes, uh, Nate Mahalko. He's really fast. Last year was his rookie year. He had a rough year because in the fall, a couple weeks before Grands, he broke his leg. Just had a accident on the track and got busted up. So it's been a it's been a little struggle to get him fully recovered. But he's back in action. He's racing again this year. How did and that first interaction go when you started? having somebody be interested, you know, a pro rider being interested in working with you. He actually wasn't pro when I approached him. He was in the amateur level, and I raced him. It, he was just one of the first people that I had raced personally coming back into it, and I just really liked him as a person. He was really easy to talk to. He loved my bike. He recognized that it was something he never saw before, and he was like, wow, that's really cool, man. Where'd you get that? What is that? And I said, Do you I get that a lot? A lot. Yeah. Yeah, I get that a lot. Now, not so much. Because people are seeing them. Because people know yeah. what it is, who I am. So that's kind of a cool feeling. They're like, oh, Cook, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of cool. But uh, he was he was like blown away when I was like, what's your thoughts on you know you being one of my first sponsored riders? And he was like, 
really? He's like, well, but that's super cool. Nobody ever asked me that. And he was like, yeah, I'd love to ride one of your bikes, man. So why not? And um, he's been with me ever since. How does that relationship build then? Do you build a custom bike? Um, you know, that you guys go over and then, you know, yeah. it's kind of like a build that is just for him. And yeah, then... it was. That's really where the 444 came from. That was one of the bikes in the portfolio. I didn't have to necessarily like recreate to fit in. When you say portfolio, you have different versions of bikes yeah. that uh, people can pick from. Yep. I have a little bike that's um, a 340 millimeter reach frame all the way up to this big boy on the table. That's the 477. That's the longest 20 inch bike that I make for racing. And that would be for a full size adult. These are so cool. Thank so you. then you went Thank over you. what he. So then the bike that you designed for him is now something that you offer others. Yep, yep. I put that into standard production. I thought it was a really good bike. It fits the Geo for like that. What would you call it? Pro XL range. Um, so that kind of just stayed what it was. And yeah, I've made about five of those so far. I think. When you get into, uh, and it was something Jer touched on um, when he asked, um, you know, when you didn't know what you were doing with the geometry of the bike, and then now you know how to build a bike for a person, where did you get all that knowledge, and how did you learn how to even develop it like that? Because it's not something common that you pick up on, I guess. Yeah, a lot of it is really just self-taught, man. I just Trial and error. Yeah, I just kept working at it and digging through and reading a lot of stuff and you, know, you got to put people on the bikes then after you build them and then was that kind of like the early phases of just knowing a little bit a little bit just kind of like eyeing somebody up and saying how tall you are approximately and then i came up with this whole reach idea one thing in bmx is we don't it's like the only discipline where they don't measure a bike by reach and it doesn't make any sense to me every bmx racer always just wants to go and ask you how big the top tube is on the bike and it's like practically irrelevant because we don't sit it's a sprint you're on this bike it's a 40 second race and you never touch the seat so i came up with this idea to incorporate the reach measurement which is the main way everybody measures a bike in every other discipline mountain bike road bike they want to know how long it is from where you're standing over the center of the bike to where the handlebars would be and that's the most important thing so that's actually what the model number on all my frames correlates to is the 477 is a 477 millimeter reach bike. So when you started developing that, like how long did it take for you to kind of get it all together? Um, maybe about six or seven months from the time I started. And I, what I did was I started looking at every other manufacturer. I took this main like master spreadsheet and put all the numbers in of every bike geometry that I could possibly get my hands on that's a popular frame and fit them all in to see where do all these bikes really lie. If I if I took the same size bike from every manufacturer and layered it on top of each other on a on a drawing like this blueprint that's here yeah. and we looked at it what does it actually all mean? Like where does the bottom bracket land? Where where is everything in relationship to another bike? And I found out they're kind of all over the place. There isn't really like any like set sizing so i just wanted to find a good middle ground and say yeah. let's just go somewhere in the middle of all this because you're all in these extremes so if we just keep it very i don't know mellow and make them all the same you know and let them grow from that baseline of how i'm designing this thing let's see where it lands and the 444 was really good so we just kind of tweaked it bigger smaller um and the same with like the little bikes and we came up with a really really great lineup everybody has given me nothing but positive feedback about the way they feel the kid that has this bike um he actually has another one and it's like his favorite bike in the whole world what's that like for you too for you to have you know well one how you figured out designing that because it was so confusing and then when you broke it down it was in simplest terms where you know you used to race you rode and then you just kind of looked at why they weren't doing it in a fashion that made sense to a rider and i think a lot of stuff when you look at it or you hear people complaining why people aren't doing that it always takes a person to just do it a simpler way but then 
like I don't know a lot of, of like what you're talking about with the frames, but when you explained it that way, it, it made sense. Like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you do it that way? Yeah. And then for you to lay it out like that, when somebody tells you it's their favorite bike and it's something that you built and it's above these massive brands or things that are like commercially known, how does that's it's got to be you, there's so many experiences that you have that's got to be so fulfilling with this from just even the moments of I try and going stay, over this and I it's try crazy and stay humble yeah I do I try and always <laughs> stay humble I like to just smile and say I'm glad yeah but it's like I, I'm truly glowing usually inside. yeah I try yeah. to not cheese too hard no but, but you I mean feeling. but you can tell like how much you absolutely 100% love it doing this just from the conversation now. Yep. Like it's bursting out of you. Yep. <laughs> it's yeah, so it's, cool. It's my whole life. And then you put that into the product, which not a lot of people know how to do. And then that's why you get the results of, Hey man, like this is my favorite thing you've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, what, like, where do you want this to go? Um, man, I, I would love to say I'd love to have an enormous production facility one day and have lots of employees, but I have to also ask myself, like, how much of it can I give it up before it's truly not the way it is now? I am cook. Yeah. 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 Without me starting from scratch, you know, from start to finish. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. First thing I guess I'd have to start with maybe one employee. Yeah. <laughs> and then go. That's from probably there. the hardest to get, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm waiting for my dad to retire. Yeah, and then he'll come on. Yeah. Where did the I am cook come from? Um, I am cook. I don't know really how I landed on that. It was just like <laughs> I, it was just we were in the car one night and we were just driving home from like the grocery store and it just kind of hit me. I'm like, I'm just gonna call it I am cook, not like Tony Cook bikes or something. I, I think a lot of a lot of it came with just like this weird subliminal like three syllable thing like i was listening in my head of like specialized cannondale and yeah all these other i don't know we could go on probably for a while of like bikes that are like that but it just stuck i liked it and it's me i am cook like yeah that's it's it's super unique it's so many and it works it's so many generations of my family um, like the sales aspect of it, the inventiveness, the creativity, the actual manufacturing. It's just a long, uh, long family history of people that, you know, have really been grinding away like that in, in this specific field. And I just thought I am cook. That's, that's me. What's it like for your family? Um, Cause now that you, I, I totally forgot the beginning of this all started from the building and all that. What's it like for them to sit here and see you completely go on your own and carve out your own thing. And you're essentially doing a version of what you watched growing up. They are so proud. It's not even funny, man. My dad is great. I love him. He comes over to my house almost every day around four 30. He leaves my uncle Ben's garage. He has his own shop. And they have coffee at three, and then they'll come over <laughs> to my house to see what I worked on for yeah. the day. And lately, he's been telling me, "Don't take any of this stuff over and show Uncle Ben. He'll probably get pissed off. It's so nice. He can't weld like that anymore." <laughs> <laughs> so it's cool, man. Everybody in my family is just really happy. I'm sure uh, my grandfather is extremely pleased. Yeah. Down on me. Yeah. How does the process work for uh, somebody purchasing a bike or uh, finding out how to purchase a bike from you? I mean, did it start out with just kind of word of mouth and then you get on the phone with people and then you built it into online or like, yeah. how's, how's that work if somebody is interested in buying something? Um, Instagram and Facebook have been my friends. Usually they just reach out to me and say, hey, like, what's the process? I don't see you have a website. I don't, I still don't have a website yet. That's going to yeah. be the next big thing is going to get some kind of e-commerce where we can have an option for what size bike you want, your finish, add to cart, and um, give you like an estimated time of building and that whole thing. I'd like to have it hooked to Google to where like once your bike goes into production, you can get an email sent to, hey, you know, like your bike is being produced, like it's in the jig, or hey, your bike is going to finish, it's at the paint yeah. shop. Where they're just walking you or taking you through and yeah. getting notifications the entire time on like the steps of where your bike's at. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. Um, so right now it's just kind of like a one-on-one -on -one personal experience? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. People reach out. The There's one frame that I just got back from paint that is going to go to Colorado. That guy found me on Al Kane's website, sugarcane.com. He saw my bike on there for bike of the day. 
and is now up for bike of the year. We're doing pretty good too. We're like in the top 10 for bike of the year. Is that uh, primarily a lot of what you're seeing is like word of mouth and yeah. people seeing you at the track and yeah, stuff like that? Definitely. Definitely. It's just totally organic. Yeah. Um, that's always the, that's always, I, I feel the best feeling when you just start cutting stuff in from all over the place. And then like one person's over here, then they see something on Instagram. Then you have a kid from the track. Like it, it's cool when you start seeing how far it goes out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really lucky. I don't know if I could have done the same thing when I was a kid without the advertising that's out there now, without actually being able to put pictures out and do stuff. I think it would have been a, a bit more of a struggle. Maybe not. Maybe it would have just been a slower go. I don't know. I say that to myself all the time. Where would I have been if I never stopped riding or racing? Um, where would I be at now? Like, would my company be huge? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Would I have... Would I have even done it? I don't know. I don't know where I would actually be at now if I stayed racing. But I'm really glad I didn't. I feel like a lot of it got bottled up and a lot of the creativity was stuck inside my head and ideas floating around for so long that finally when I got back in the building, a lot of things came out real quick. Like there was just so much. It was like Tupac when he came out of jail. Tupac. He had like, like 20 <laughs> albums. Uh, last night, Tucker kept telling us that it was Tupac, Shakur. Tupac. <laughs> yeah. You thought um, it was Tupac? <laughs> <laughs> so funny that that came up. Um, and that whole lesson to this. Uh, when you take that break, um, it's, it's weird because... Um, you take it because you're either burned out on it or you feel like you don't want to do it anymore. And then when you were talking about like it all bottles up, like it almost like if it's meant to be, I feel like it pulls you back. How long was your break when you took it? Maybe 2013 to no, no, not 2013, 2003. I would say is probably when I stopped racing. Yeah. Till 2018. Yeah. 2019 is probably when I went to the track the first time with the DJ. So probably like 15 years anyway, 16 years. So then you're like, at this point, you're a hundred percent into bikes right now and you're building and you're racing at the same time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I train with my team about two days a week. We have a small little race team out of Scranton. Well, that's what I was going to ask next then. It's like, because there's so much stuff that you're doing, but I mean, you built a team then? Yeah. That's got to be crazy coming from that and then having your own bikes and building your own team and yep. sponsoring a pro or amateur that then goes pro. And yeah, we actually, uh, this year we're going to do, we're going to actually do like a JV and a varsity squad. We're going to have some newer additions to our team that are younger riders that are more novice. They're just starting, but you could see they have that drive. And I think being a part of a team is just beneficial for kids. It gives them more of a place. Like, I know when I was a kid, I didn't belong to a team. And I always kind of felt a little bit like an outsider, like going to races. And you see these teams and you don't have like a group that you kind of at least congregate with. Um, so it's good for just their overall morale at the track. And I think it keeps them in the sport longer. But we're going to use this kind of jv varsity thing as a reason for them to do better like once you achieve that varsity status you'll get like the varsity sleeves and you'll get to ride on that squad yeah. with the fast kids and all the fast kids are going to have you know like a little bit different uniform and maybe a little different rider package like we'll pay for their state series races as opposed to the varsity kids might not get that it's got to be completely i mean for you to have been doing this as a kid and being around it and building it. And then now as an adult, this is your career and life. It's got to be surreal at times. Cause the more you keep explaining this, I'm like, Holy shit. I'm like, this is things he did as a kid. Now he gets to have control of these things as an adult for other kids. Plus he's still racing. Plus you're making your bikes. Um, it's gotta be, it feels like a dream. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of days it really feels like I'm dreaming. It's, <laughs> It's easy to get lost down in the in the shop for hours. Like last night I worked till probably 1030 and was just in my own little zone, like just yeah. grinding away, doing my thing. It's like it's not even hard. It's just a step. Like I just know all, there's all this stuff that has to get done and none of it's going to get done if I don't keep going. Yeah. Um, 
but once again, back to that whole thing of I'm building this for someone. Like I have all these, like right now I have all these kids on my mind that are expecting Santa to have a I Am Cooked bike for them. And yeah, you're definitely Santa this year. And I told them all this year, I was like, guys, just so you know, don't trust those elves to weld your bike. I'm like, they still, Santa still has to get it off me. I still am going to make your bike. So even if you ask Santa for it, I still have to ship it all the way to the North Pole. And he's got to figure out where to put it in his sleigh so it's in, like, order. So when it gets to your house, he gives you the right color. And they're funny. The kids are all laughing. <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's really surreal just hearing the whole story and how it, it falls out and then um, it just it really just played itself out into like these passions and things that you love and then to to take a break from it but then to be pulled that hard back into it and then now to have completely made a career out of it mm -hmm. it's got to be crazy and then I'd be able to have your dad stop by the shop which is now rolls reverse where you were probably hanging out at the shop when you were younger. Yep. And it, it's just it's 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 weird the way it completely mirrors itself. Yep. I would always wonder to myself, what are all these little short little stubby pieces of metal all over the welding bench? How come they're always all over the welding bench? And now my welding bench looks exactly the same when you're done welding a little like a like you're done with a stick, you just like throw the thing on the pile. And it's just like some OCD for every welder. Yeah, I, don't yeah, know why, yeah. I don't know why we do it, but we save the little nubs and you just throw them like on the bench. You're not going to throw them on the floor and it's still hot when you're done. I guess you just throw it on the metal workbench, but. That's crazy, man. Now, now I know why they're all there. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see yourself growing this like um, within the next couple of years to a point where you would you would need an employee? Like, do you want to like how crazy are the orders coming in? Do you feel overwhelmed? Like. I don't feel Where do you even find anybody to really help you? Is it something that, you know, are you going to just start with somebody to help out in the shop? Or are you going to look for somebody who's completely skilled? Or, you um, know, where do you see the growth to the next step? Because I know with building everything, you kind of know what the next step is ahead of you. And you have yeah. all these bikes coming in and whatnot. But, like, I, I what's that big step that's going to push it? The next thing would be definitely get somebody to help me give up a little bit of the control and let them do more of the small process stuff that's, like, repeat stuff that's, you know, like cleanup and prep work. There's a lot yeah. of, you know, just like if you... Little see, things that'll slow you down. Yeah, if you see the graining to all the tubing on that bike, I do all that on a belt sander, and it all takes time. Everyone has to... Every tube has to get shined up. They don't look like that when I start. So before anything gets cut, all the tubes could get prepped, and that could just be somebody's job. That doesn't have to necessarily be done by me. There's lots of little things that... I'm going to have to eventually say, okay, this is just like extra be, weight. Yeah. That's going to be like, Hey, like this is the kind of stuff that slows me down totally. to getting to like the actual things that make it my bike. Or I have to start, start doing some stuff where I sub out other processes that I already do in house and just have it like totally automated where right now I'm making all the dropouts. That was the last little post I did last night. I threw up a thing of me doing all the machine work for the rear end parts. That might be something that I eventually don't have made the way I do now in house where I could just have a company do say a lost wax casting and then it's just a part that's cast it's not this fully machined piece anymore that takes so much time and machine cost a casting is very repeatable um, it's just I had to get to a point where my decision was finalized on design and we could prove that it works and I'm happy with it and then we'll probably go on and have that taken away now I don't have to I don't have to uh, dedicate any time to making that anymore. Like all that time that I was making that little part could be actually assembling a frame where I'm just getting that part. It's it's at a cost associated. I know what it costs to put that in now. And when we get low, we just order more and go from there. Looking at the frame here, and I don't, I don't know if you want to hold it up and kind of go over what makes this unique and what makes it yours. But like where does this whole process start on would be the first thing that's even – put together or like you know like where does it where does it begin um definitely in my head yeah yeah uh as far as like designing it i guess yeah starts on paper draw a big long line and that's going to be your axle plane and then you're gonna from there i determine what the head angle of the bike's going to be that's the second line that gets plotted and then from there you're going to kind of you're going to know what you're building so you're going to know what size fork the bike is going to take once it's put together so you're going to draw in an imaginary fork to show how that big you know how that lo how long that's going to be uh then your head tube gets put down then you would move back to the rear end and 
determine what bottom bracket height you're going to have and how long the frame's going to be. So then you could plot how high up the bottom bracket's going to be. That's where like the pedals go through. You'll plot where that is. So that's going to determine how long the bike is and how high the bike feels off the ground. Because if the bottom bracket's real low, it feels real low, but then you have this weird feeling where like your pedals are going to drag. But if you put it too high up in the air, it feels like you're standing on a mountain. Yeah. And like you're going to like fall off like it's real top heavy. You want that to be in its sweet spot. So that gets put where it needs to go. And from there, you could start kind of drawing the lines of what where the tubing is to connect all the dots. Put the dropout in so you know where the rear axle is going to be. And um, yeah, then we can take it down to the basement, hang it on the wall, figure out how long each tube is to where each tube is going to have to be cut. You're going to figure out the intersecting angles to where they're going to intersect the next tube and start cutting metal. Are you constantly changing the design and how this bike is to be better each time you make them? And then like, is there always like the thought of what you can do differently? Or are you just trying to kind of stamp out or is it different for every person that buys them? Um, no, once the designs were, once the designs were written and everything was proven, like after the first one was made, there were really no revisions we had to make and go back once once everything was good and I felt like that bike was solid for that particular size. It was like stamp of approval. Yeah. Put that into production. That's officially a bike you can buy. That's cool. Yeah. What was it like for the first time you did that? And you sold the first one and like you had the second one coming up? Um, I think one of the coolest ones was probably like my first unsolicited sale where some random person just messaged strangers. me on Facebook. Yeah, and was like, those hey, are always the best sales, I've strangers. I've been following you. How do I get one of your bikes? I'm like, uh, I don't I don't know, actually. Is he following me home? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how you're getting this bike. <laughs> how do you fi figure out shipping and all that stuff? Because that's a headache if they're not somebody locally. Yeah. What was it like growing the business into that? Um, Not bad, not bad. The shipping's not bad. Luckily for me, a lot of them are local. Yeah. Um. I have to send one out on Monday that's going to go to Colorado, so we'll pack that up all nice, nice, and make sure it's going to make it. And then you ship right out? Yep, ship it yeah. out. Yeah. That's cool, man. This uh, I talked to you on the phone, and um, I Jer had mentioned it, and then when I reached out to you and talked, I was like, oh, I can't wait to do it. I'm like, because I just knew there was so much drive and passion, but then to hear the entire story and then to hear – how it was this thing that you fell in love with and then the photographer and then that brought it full circle. And then now it's like your childhood is now your adulthood, but it's your career, your hobby, your passion, and then you're racing again. Uh, I couldn't be happier for you, man. It's a, it's a really remarkable story. I'm quite possibly the luckiest man alive. It's, it's really cool. It's really cool the way it all happened. And I'm sure this is the Disney version and there was stuff in the middle that was hard things that you had to oh, overcome. Yeah. And, there was a lot of shit, yeah, man. There were yeah. some days that I really yeah. wondered, what am I doing? Yeah, and uh, I've been through that stuff too. So uh, I love having people on that take the risk of, um, you know, leaving that toxic situation and that drive into work. And that's why I always bring that up because it's, I hated, I hated those drives in. And it's like when people, you know, I, I love motivating people and having motivating people come on here that took that risk because it's so scary to do. But if you believe in the things that you're doing and you have a support system and you're passionate enough about something, you can turn it into career. And I just feel like you're one of the best examples I've had on the show. And it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Um, I want to give you a second to plug where you can get your bikes, how anyone can get a hold of you, what the social media is to follow and like anything that has to do with I am cook. For one, start racing bikes. Go to your local USA BMX track if you don't race and go take a lap. They all have loaner bikes. You can go ride, I think, for free for the first time if you want, just as a new rider, just to try it out. Um, I highly recommend it to everybody. It's so much fun to just go around the track. You're not gonna you're not gonna set the world on fire, but it's just great. The tracks are all easily rideable by any skill level, any age, any person. Um, you could find me at a local track cause I race all around. And if you don't find me at a local track, you can come to, uh, I am cook dot bicycles on Instagram or Facebook soon to have a website. Um, still to be determined for what the web address is going to be, but yeah, I am cook bicycles. I am cook dot bicycles on at, on Instagram or Facebook. And that's pretty much how you can get the ball rolling if you want one. 
Cool. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, if you're a first time listener, first time watcher, it's everything that we're doing is on neveragainstudio.com. Uh, if you're on Instagram, there's a link tree on there now. So it'll take you directly to the YouTube, directly to the website. But that is anything never again, uh, neveragainstudio.com. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. I appreciate you driving in, too. That wasn't uh, a close. It wasn't an easy drive or yeah, whatever. No, so I appreciate it. We're used to being in the car traveling. Our races, it seems like our tracks for us, we're in a weird spot where everything is at least an hour away. My home track's an hour away. Um, if I oh, wanna, You guys are road warriors when you're doing those Yeah, if I want to go to races. Trilogy, it's like an hour and 30 minutes. HC is about two hours. So everything is just travel time. I appreciate it regardless. Yeah, no, it's cool, man. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. We'll do it again. Sweet. Thank you, brother. Sweet. Yeah, what a... Never Again Radio. Get into it, brother.